Section 47 of La Sommoir. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. La Sommoir by Emile Zola. Translated by Ernest A. Visitelli. Fourth part of Chapter 10. Yes, Coupeau was spinning an evil thread. The time was past when a drink would make him feel good. His unhealthy, soft fat of earlier years had melted away, and he was beginning to wither and turn a leaden grey. He seemed to have a greenish tint, like a corpse putrefying in a pond. He no longer had a taste for food, not even the most beautifully prepared stew. His stomach would turn, and his decayed teeth refused to touch it. A pint a day was his daily ration, the only nourishment he could digest. When he awoke in the mornings, he sat coughing and spitting up bile for at least a quarter of an hour. It never failed. He might as well have the basin ready. He was never steady on his pins till after his first glass of consolation, a real remedy, the fire of which cauterized his bowels. But during the day his strength returned. At first he would feel a tickling sensation, a sort of pins and needles in his hands and feet. And he would joke, relating that someone was having a lark with him, that he was sure his wife put horsehair between the sheets. Then his legs would become heavy, the tickling sensation would end by turning into the most abominable cramps, which gripped his flesh as though in a vice. That, though, did not amuse him so much. He no longer laughed. He stopped suddenly on the pavement in a bewildered way, with a ringing in his ears, and his eyes blinded with sparks. Everything appeared to him to be yellow. The houses danced, and he reeled about for three seconds, with the fear of suddenly finding himself sprawling on the ground. At other times, when the sun was shining full on his back, he would shiver as though iced water had been poured down his shoulders. What bothered him the most was a slight trembling of both his hands. The right hand especially must have been guilty of some crime. It suffered from so many nightmares. Mon Dieu, was he then no longer a man? He was becoming an old woman. He furiously strained his muscles. He seized hold of his glass, and bet that he would hold it perfectly steady, as with a hand of marble. But in spite of his efforts, the glass danced about, jumped to the right, jumped to the left, with a hurried and regular trembling movement. Then in a fury he emptied it into his gullet, yelling that he would require dozens like it, and afterwards he undertook to carry a cask without so much as moving a finger. Gervaise, on the other hand, told him to give up drink if he wished to cease trembling, and he laughed at her, emptying quarts until he experienced the sensation again, flying into a rage and accusing the passing omnibuses of shaking up his liquor. In the month of March, Coupeau returned home one evening soaked through. He had come with my boots from Montrouge, where they had stuffed themselves full of eel soup, and he had received the full force of the shower all the way from the Barrière des Fourneaux to the Barrière Poissonnière, a good distance. During the night he was seized with a confounded fit of coughing. He was very flushed, suffering from a violent fever, and panting like a broken bellows. When the Bosch's doctor saw him in the morning, and listened against his back, he shook his head, and drew Gervaise aside to advise her to have her husband taken to the hospital. Coupeau was suffering from pneumonia. Gervaise did not worry herself, you may be sure. At one time she would have been chopped into pieces before trusting her old man to the sawbones. After the accident in the Rue de la Nation, she had spent their savings in nursing him. But those beautiful sentiments don't last when men take to wallowing in the mire. No, no, she did not intend to make a fuss like that again. They might take him and never bring him back. She would thank them heartily. Yet when the litter arrived and Coupeau was put into it like an article of furniture, she became all pale and bit her lips. And if she grumbled and still said it was a good job, her heart was no longer in her words. Had she but ten francs in her drawer, she would not have let him go. 
she accompanied him to the La Riboisiere hospital, saw the nurses put him to bed at the end of a long hall, where the patients in a row, looking like corpses, raised themselves up and followed with their eyes the comrade who had just been brought in. It was a veritable death-chamber. There was a suffocating, feverish odour, and a chorus of coughing. The long hall gave the impression of a small cemetery with its double row of white beds looking like an aisle of marble tombs. When Coupeau remained motionless on his pillow, Gervaise left, having nothing to say, nor anything in her pocket that could comfort him. Outside she turned to look up at the monumental structure of the hospital, and recalled the days when Coupeau was working there, putting on the zinc roof, perched up high and singing in the sun. He wasn't drinking in those days. She used to watch for him from her window in the Hôtel Boncoeur, and they would both wave their handkerchiefs in greeting. Now, instead of being on the roof like a cheerful sparrow, he was down below. He had built his own place in the hospital where he had come to die. Mon Dieu! It all seemed so far away now, that time of young love. On the day after the morrow, when Gervaise called to obtain news of him, she found the bed empty. A sister of charity told her that they had been obliged to remove her husband to the asylum of Sainte Anne, because the day before he had suddenly gone wild. Oh, a total leave-taking of his senses, attempts to crack his skull against the wall, howls which prevented the other patients from sleeping. It all came from drink, it seemed. Gervaise went home very upset. Well, her husband had gone crazy. What would it be like if he came home? Nana insisted that they should leave him in the hospital, because he might end by killing both of them. Gervaise was not able to go to Sainte anne until Sunday. It was a tremendous journey. Fortunately, the omnibus from the boulevard Rochechouart to La Glacière passed close to the asylum. She went down the Rue de la Santé, buying two oranges on her way, so as not to arrive empty-handed. It was another monumental building, with grey courtyards, interminable corridors, and a smell of rank medicaments, which did not exactly inspire liveliness. But when they had admitted her into a cell, she was quite surprised to see Coupeau almost jolly. He was just then seated on the throne, a spotlessly clean wooden case, and they both laughed at her finding him in this position. Well, one knows what an invalid is. He squatted there like a pope, with his cheek of earlier days. Oh, he was better, as he could do this. And the pneumonia? inquired the laundress. Done for, replied he. They cured it in no time. I still cough a little, but that's all there is left of it. Then at the moment of leaving the throne to get back into his bed, he joked once more. It's lucky you have a strong nose and are not bothered. They laughed louder than ever. At heart they felt joyful. It was by way of showing their contentment without a host of phrases that they thus joked together. One must have had to do with patience to know the pleasure one feels at seeing all their functions at work again. When he was back in bed, she gave him the two oranges, and this filled him with emotion. He was becoming quite nice again, ever since he had had nothing but tisane to drink. She ended by venturing to speak to him about his violent attack, surprised at hearing him reason, like in the good old times. "'Ah, yes,' said he, joking at his own expense, "'I talked a precious lot of nonsense.' Just fancy I saw rats and ran about on all fours to put a grain of salt under their tails. And you, you'd call to me. Men were trying to kill you. In short, all sorts of stupid things. Ghosts in broad daylight. Now oh, I remember it well. My noodle's still solid. Now it's over. I dream a bit when I'm asleep. I have nightmares, but everyone has nightmares. Gervaise remained with him until the evening. When the house-surgeon came at the six o'clock inspection, he made him spread his hands. They hardly trembled at all, scarcely a quiver at the tips of the fingers. However, as night approached, Cooper was little by little seized with uneasiness. He twice sat up in bed looking on the ground and in the dark corners of the room. Suddenly he thrust out an arm and appeared to crush some vermin against the wall. 
"'What is it?' asks Gervaise, frightened. "'The rats! The rats!' murmured he. Then, after a pause, gliding into sleep, he tossed about, uttering disconnected phrases. "'Mon Dieu! They're tearing my skin! Oh, they're filthy beasts! Keep steady! Hold your skirts right round you! Beware of the dirty bloke behind you! Mon Dieu! She's down, and the scoundrels laugh! Scoundrels! Blackguards! Brigands! He dealt blows into space, caught hold of his blanket, and rolled it into a bundle against his chest, as though to protect the latter from the violence of the bearded men whom he beheld. Then, an attendant having hastened to the spot, Gervaise withdrew, quite frozen by the scene. But when she returned a few days later, she found Coupeau completely cured. Even the nightmares had left him. He could sleep his ten hours right off as peacefully as a child, and without stirring a limb. So his wife was allowed to take him away. The house-surgeon gave him the usual good advice on leaving, and advised him to follow it. If he recommenced drinking, he would again collapse, and would end by dying. Yes, it solely depended upon himself. He had seen how jolly and healthy one could become if one did not get drunk. Well, he must continue at home the sensible life he had led at saint anne fancy himself under lock and key, and that dram-shops no longer existed. "'The gentleman's right,' said Gervaise in the omnibus, which was taking them back to the rue de la Goutte d'Or. "'Of course he's right,' replied Coupeau. Then, after thinking a minute, he resumed, "'Oh, you know, a little glass now and again can't kill a man. "'It helps the digestion.' "'And that very evening he swallowed a glass of bad spirit "'just to keep his stomach in order. "'For eight days he was pretty reasonable. "'He was a great coward at heart. "'He had no desire to end his days in the Bicetre madhouse. "'But his passion got the better of him. "'The first little glass led him, in spite of himself, "'to a second, to a third, and to a fourth and at the end of a fortnight he had got back to his old ration, a pint of vitriol a day. Gervaise, exasperated, could have beaten him. To think that she had been stupid enough to dream once more of leading a worthy life, just because she had seen him at the asylum in full possession of his good sense. Another joyful hour had flown, the last one, no doubt. Ah, now, as nothing could reclaim him, not even the fear of his near death, she swore she would no longer put herself out. The home might be at all at sixes and sevens, she did not care any longer, and she talked also of leaving him. Then hell upon earth recommenced, a life sinking deeper into the mire, without a glimmer of hope for something better to follow. Nana, whenever her father clouted her, furiously asked why the brute was not at the hospital. She was awaiting the time when she would be earning money, she would say, to treat him to brandy and make him croak quicker. Gervaise, on her side, flew into a passion one day that Cooper was regretting their marriage. Ah, she had brought him her saucy children. Ah, she had got herself picked up from the pavement, wheedling him with rosy dreams. Mon Dieu, he had a rare cheek. So many words, so many lies. She hadn't wished to have anything to do with him, that was the truth. He had dragged himself at her feet to make her give way, whilst she was advising him to think well what he was about. And if it was all to come over again, he would hear how she would just say, No! She would sooner have an arm cut off. Yes, she'd had a lover before him, but a woman who has had a lover, and who is a worker, is worth more than a sluggard of a man who sullies his honour and that of his family in all the dram-shops. That day, for the first time, the Coupos went in for a general brawl, and they whacked each other so hard that an old umbrella and the broom were broken. Gervaise kept her word. She sank lower and lower. She missed going to her work oftener, spent whole days in gossiping, and became as soft as a rag whenever she had a task to perform. If a thing fell from her hands, it might remain on the floor. It was certainly not she who would have stooped to pick it up. She took her ease about everything, and never handled a broom except when the accumulation of filth almost brought her to the ground. The Lorieurs now made a point of holding something to their noses whenever they passed her room. 
the stench was poisonous said they those hypocrites slyly lived at the end of the passage out of the way of all these miseries which filled the corner of the house with whimpering locking themselves in so as not to have to lend twenty sous pieces oh kind-hearted folks neighbours awfully obliging yes you may be sure one had only to knock and ask for a light or a pinch of salt or a jug of water one was certain of getting the door banged in one's face with all that they had vipers tongues they protested everywhere that they never occupied themselves with other people this was true whenever it was a question of assisting a neighbour but they did so from morning to night directly they had a chance of pulling any one to pieces with the door bolted and a rug hung up to cover the chinks and the keyhole, they would treat themselves to a spiteful gossip, without leaving their gold wire for a moment. The fall of Clump Clump in particular kept them purring like pet cats. Completely ruined, not a sou remaining. They smiled gleefully at the small piece of bread she would bring back when she went shopping, and kept count of the days when she had nothing at all to eat. And the clothes she wore now, disgusting rags. That's what happened when one tried to live high. Gervaise, who had an idea of the way in which they spoke of her, would take her shoes off and place her ear against their door. But the rug over the door prevented her from hearing much. She was heartily sick of them. She continued to speak to them, to avoid remarks, though expecting nothing but unpleasantness from such nasty persons, but no longer having strength even to give them as much as they gave her, passed the insults off as a lot of nonsense. And besides, she only wanted her own pleasure, to sit in a heap twirling her thumbs, and only moving when it was a question of amusing herself. Nothing more. End of fourth part of chapter 10 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey